Hello, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with all of you and to be able to share with you a perspective about where the world of computing is going. And what we're going to be exploring is going to be the intersection of uh, classical information and quantum information. And as I imagine, not many of you might be very familiar with quantum computing. Uh, you know, we'll have an opportunity to give a bit of an overview and intersect uh, the community of Ray and what this is going to mean for the future. I'd like to start telling you where I work. Uh, we're in beautiful San Francisco. This is the beautiful location that serves as the research headquarters of IBM. It's about 45 minutes uh, north of New York City in a building that was designed by Eero Saarinen. And uh, it serves as a headquarters of, uh, of a global community of research. Uh, IBM Research has been, you know, is one of the premier research organizations in the world, industrial research organizations, uh, for almost 80 years. And uh, we're a community of about 3,000 scientists and engineers, uh, mathematicians, uh, experts in computer science, in quantum information, in semiconductor technology, a whole variety. But what brings us all together and makes us incre incredibly passionate is to explore always the future of computing and, um, and ways to advance the science of information. So today I want to revisit um, an old question, uh, which, is, which we take for granted in our IT world, which is, what is information? And, uh, and what are the origins? And to understand the current situation, um, I think it's useful to go back to the seminal work uh, of Cloud Shannon. Right, so Cloud Shannon in the 1940s uh, famously gave us a mathematical grounding uh, for how to understand uh, information. He pre defined it quite precisely as information is the resolution of uncertainty. And he was able to you know, introduce to all of us the, the idea of the binary digit, the bit. And famously, he separated physics and information, meaning he said, look, independent of how you want to process information, whether you're going to have vacuum tubes or transistors, or how you're going to communicate information through wires or wirelessly, you can decouple the medium and still understand how you can reliably create, store, manipulate, and send those bits um, error-free, as an example. So we had this grounding, this base assumption that we've mo we built modern computing on, on the idea of bits, and on this separation right, between the physical manifestation of how we create and process and communicate the bits and, um, and, and, uh, and the information itself. And we're going to come in a minute to revisit whether that idea is true. Right? But, um, but that was the, the, the grounding of it. And of course, as a byproduct of that theoretical and foundational edifice combined with Moore's law, we have built you know, some of the most sophisticated machines that humans have ever created. I mean, I give an example of a recently launched Z16 system. 70% uh, of the world's transactions run on, on Z systems around the world. And this is like a marvel of technology. You can have you know, down times of a couple seconds a year uh, in a system. Single machine can process over a trillion. Uh, transactions a day. We put an AI inference engine in the microprocessor so we can run 300 billion AI models uh, a day uh, in these kinds of systems. So within a millisecond latency of a transaction, you can run an AI model now natively. So you can use, you know, state-of-the-art semiconductor technology. A, a microprocessor can have over 20 billion transistors. We also uh, announced last year, just to show like the limits of what is going to be possible with technology, the first two nanometer technology uh, demonstrator in an Albany facility in New York. And so we're down a path where we will be able to build uh, not only tens of billions of transistors in a single chip, but in the future, we can imagine a future where we may have as many as a trillion transistors in a single chip. So the power, the reliability of these bit-based architectures is just simply phenomenal. One of the grandest achievements in engineering uh, that humans have, have ever created. But I told you that we were going to revisit the question of what is the nature of information? What can information be? And to look at this question, if the intersection of mathematics and information gave us the world of bits, we're going to explore how physics and information is going to give us the world of qubits. And therefore, this is going to be the origin of this thesis that the future of computing is going to be classical information and quantum information combined together. Quantum information is not going to replace classical information. 
they're going to work in concert. And we're going to go and explore a little bit more. What is it? What is the nature of this quantum information? And then um, how will we combine them, right? And what is the role of, of Ray uh, in doing that? To understand why sh we should even care about it, I think it's also useful to look at it from a um, complexity theory perspective and recognize the fact that as amazing as our computers are today, the reality is that from a complexity theory perspective, they can only solve easy problems, in quotes. And what we mean by that is that the number of variables that we have to compute over cannot grow exponentially. The fact of the matter is there are many problems in the world where the number of variables are exponential. Examples include modeling all natural systems. If you actually try to uh, model a molecule, the number of electron orbitals that are present in your molecule around it as the number of electron orbitals continues to grow, you have an exponential calculation. And definitely, we have molecules that have hundreds and, you know, and, and, uh, and even thousands of, uh, of electron orbitals there present. So now you have an exponential there. There are calculations in optimization that are exponential. There are problems in machine learning that have exponential number of variables. So factoring is a good example of it, that we know there's exponential cost in factoring uh, numbers, and we use it effectively for cryptography. So there is a class of problems that if we could solve them more efficiently or exactly, we could derive great value for business and for science. Now, quantum is the only technology we know that alters the equation between what's possible to solve and what was intractable from a classical point of view, meaning the best we could do is to approximate the answer. Notice I am not claiming that quantum solves all hard problems. All I'm saying is that there's an important subset of problems that quantum is going to make a difference. So why? Where does that power come from? Where does that exponential power come from? So let's explore our representation. So we're going to use a representation where we're going to use these spheres to um, give an illustration of how to understand the nature of information. And in classical world, of course, we have only two states. We have a zero state or a one state. Uh, the transistor defines the flow of current that defines that zero and one. And in quantum world, one of the properties that we're going to use is that we could have a superposition of states. We can have combinations of zero and one state. So in this case, we're going to represent in a sphere that if something is in the North Pole, we're going to call it a zero. Something is in the South Pole, we're going to call it a one. A qubit has a superposition of zero and one states. So therefore, you see those two little pink uh, dots in the zero and one state. But importantly, because we can create linear superpositions of zero and one state, we can actually define that state of information through a complex number. It has an amplitude and a phase. So for visual representation purposes, imagine them as little moons that are in the sphere. So now in my southern pole, I have a moon that has a phase. And therefore, what you're seeing here is just a simple rotation of that moon. right? So I now have a control, not only on having multiple states, but on the rotation that these states can have. You'll see why this is important in a second. Because we're going to bring in three principles, three cap uh, capabilities from physics into how we create, manipulate, and process information. The three uh, ideas from physics we're going to bring is superposition, entanglement, and interference. We're going to very quickly uh, show you how this works. So the idea of superposition is that if we have now two states, I mean, I just show you an example. You have a zero state. You have a one state. You can combine them. And now you can have a new state that is a zero and a one. And you can have any kind of combination of that states. But I told you, importantly, that one of these uh, tricks that I can start performing is that I can introduce now a superposition state that is different the left and the right. Right? The left has no rotations. On the right-hand side, I've rotated 180 degrees the one state. OK, so I can create superposition states with this trick of phase. The second principle I'm going to use is notoriously one of the hardest problems you know, to uh, you know, explain in 30 seconds uh, in physics, which is the idea of entanglement. So I'm going to just do an analogy that imagine that you have a coin. In classical world, on the world of computing of zeros and ones, you have a single coin. And the coin is either heads or tails. Now, in quantum world, I mean, in classical world, if you have two coins, and you're spinning both coins, and you perform a measurement, whether one coin is heads or tails, 
is totally independent probability as to whether the other coin will be heads or tails, right? The probabilities are independent in classical coin world. In quantum world, if I'm spinning the two coins and I perform a measurement, if my coins were entangled, I now can have these perfect correlations that when one is heads, the other one is always heads, or when one is tails, the other one is always tails. This is one of those things that is like a mind-blowing, you know, sort of realization that that is how the world works. And uh, it has some really profound implications about the nature of information. So one of the things that we're going to be able to do here, where the exponential power comes from, is if I now have five states, right? I have five qubits. Remember they're in a superposition here of 0 and 1. And I create a quantum computer that combines these five states. The number of states that I have available in my quantum computer goes as 2 to the n. So in this case, since I have five qubits, I have 32 states that I get to control over. If I have 100 qubits, I have 2 to the 100, which happens to be more states than there are atoms of planet Earth. So the number of states that I get to represent in my computer is exponential with the number of qubits. So the third principle is this idea of interference. And then we're going to bring it all together to show you how an algorithm works. So interference is this idea like waves in the ocean, right? where you can have crests that peak and things that cancel out. So in my quantum representation here, I have a 0 and 1 state. Remember, I could create a, another state that had a phase rotation. But because this is rotated 180 degrees, if I sum the two states, I cancel one of the states. Right? When I add them up, the math works out that you can get to cancel out. So now, in quantum computers, one of the things we can do is we can amplify and cancel information, like waves in the ocean interfering with one another. So let's bring it all together. How does an algorithm work? The way an algorithm works in a quantum computer is the first thing you do in a quantum computer is you put the computer in a superposition of all available states. If I have 100 qubits, I have 2 to the 100 states. Okay, That's step one. Step two is I need to put the data inside the quantum computer. What that means in practice is creating these phase rotations of the states. So the data is encoded by taking those large number of states and rotating it. And now I have data inside my quantum computer. And the art of writing an algorithm is the art of taking all of those states that now has the data embedded and evolving it such that you interfere the states such that the right answer is maximized and all the other answers that you don't care about get canceled out. I just want to point out how different it is than the way a classical computer works. So if you look at that representation, the richness with which you can create an algorithm and manipulate information in a quantum computer is very different than what you can do with a classical machine. At the root of it, the nature of an algorithm and a software program, at the very bottom of it, just like we all learn in you know, early uh, logic and computer science, they are gates. In classical world, we have the famous ands and ors and nots and xors and so on. Well, there's an equivalent set and actually an extended set of gates that are present in quantum world. Today, you learn about just one example of them, right? You learn about the Z gate. And the Z gate allows you to do a rotation. But there are many other gates that do other properties. I'm not going to go into details of it today. But suffice it to say, that the core primitive, that is the basis of a quantum program, is something called a quantum circuit. And the way that you look at a quantum circuit is, in this case, you're seeing a four qubit quantum computer. You read them like music scores, right? And there's like a pentagram, right? So you have four lines, four qubits. You put gates. You read it from left to right. And the sequence of operations of gates is the execution of the algorithm. And at the end, you perform a measurement. You get an answer. And that is the basis of the result of your program. So what problems you can use it for? Why does it matter? There's two broad classes of problems for which we have strong you know, proofs that we can deliver exponential speed ups once we have sufficiently advanced technology. The first one is simulating nature. Nature, of course, 
obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. The original insight of creating quantum computers is that if we can create machines that behave according to quantum mechanics, we could model those systems much more, much more efficiently. So in the industrial sector, everybody that relies on like physics, chemistry simulations, material science, creating a better battery technology, you know, a better catalyst for an industrial process, is going to benefit from this. The second one is data that has structure. Factoring is a famous example of that, right? You take two prime numbers, you multiply them together. Those are the two private keys. The product of the two prime numbers is the public key that we use for uh, cryptography. That number, uh, it's an exponentially hard problem for classical computers to solve. But you know, famously, Shor's algorithm shows that you can solve that problem exponentially faster. And then there will be a class of problems for which it's a non-exponential speed up. The speed up could be quadratic, as an example. And these are things like Monte Carlo sampling and other things. So these are problems in which this matters a great deal. So how does this work in practice? So you sit in front of your computer. Um, in Python, you write your code. And we'll show an example. We send the zeros and ones over the internet. And when they get to our quantum computers in New York, they get converted into microwave pulses at about 5 gigahertz. They travel down a cryostat that operates at cryogenic temperatures, very close to absolute zero at 15 millikelvin. At the bottom, there's a quantum processor that creates these superposition, entanglement, and interference operations. You perform the measurement, you amplify the signal through the cryostat, and you return it back to the user, all transparently. We were the first institution in the world to create a quantum computer in 2016 and put it available on the cloud. Uh, we have over 20 quantum computers right now in the IBM cloud to give you a perspective. And there is a way to program these things. Um, and the most widely you know, used community to do uh, quantum information science and development is called Qiskit. It uh, stands for Quantum Information Science Kit. And um, you know, today we're going to explore the intersection of, of Qiskit and Qiskit Rantam and Ray. Um, but this is the environment that allows you to do the following. Basically, because we are reinventing the nature of what a computer is and what information, you got to redo the whole stack. And uh, we're approaching that as an open source effort. At the right-hand side, the bottom of the stack is the equivalent of assembly language right? in the classical world. Here, you have to deal with like, the low-level functions. So this is for people developing kernels. You got to worry about things like pulses and things like that. The time frame with which you have to operate is in a nanosecond regime. One level up, now you have, um, you get to the microsecond second regime or near time. Here's where Qiskit runtime does things like um, error mitigation and error correction techniques and things of this sort. Again, here the classical compute needs to be co-located with the quantum computer because of the latency. One level up at the level of algorithm developers, here now you have 100 millisecond to second latency. So here's where now serverless uh, you know, computing comes into play. And now we're going to talk about the orchestration of classical and quantum resources at that time frame. And then you have workflow orchestration at the level of users around that. So there's a hierarchy of development needs uh, that is supplied by the Qiskit environment. And this is how the community has grown and risen over uh, the last five years, since we put the well, last six years now. So this is the number of users around the world who are running their first programs on quantum computers, right? Running actual quantum circuits on quantum hardware. And what you're seeing here is that, you know, it's a community now of over 400,000 users. You've seen this exponential, um, you know, growth in number of users. So um, over a trillion, you know, close to two trillion quantum circuits now have been run on actual quantum computers. So this is you know, technology that uh, is quite real, right? It's in the you know, obviously nascent state uh, of, of development, but advancing tremendously rapidly. In fact, you know, now we have over 180 institutions from startups to Fortune 500 companies, universities, uh, national laboratories all over the world who are creating their first teams to figure out uh, how to write programs in quantum and start developing the skills to explore this new paradigm of, of computing. So yeah, over you know, 183 members altogether. So it is changing the nature of what we think a computer is. And uh, just to show you some pictures of what things look like, this is just one of our laboratories. You're seeing the inside 
uh, of one of these cryostats. Um, and uh, you know, at the very bottom of, of this is where the quantum processor sits. And this is just a laboratory, for example, that is designed to measure coherence uh, for, for these quantum systems. Um, we build full machines. Um, this is IBM Quantum System 1 that we announced uh, a few years back. This is um, you know, a fully functional quantum computer with the electronics, the cryogenics, the quantum processor, the I.O. Uh, we have field deployed these systems not only in New York, but also in Germany and Japan, and uh, plans to put them you know, in, uh, in Korea and many other nations. And also, I want to share with you a perspective of what's going to unfold in the, in the next decade. So this is what a quantum device looks like, a quantum processor looked like 10 years ago on the left-hand side, you know, a single superconducting qubit. The right-hand side is the first time anybody had built, a, you know, in, in the superconducting world, a 100-plus qubit device called Eagle that we did last year. So now, just in a, like in a microprocessor, you have your transistor plane and you have multi-layer wiring that connects all the transistors. In this case, now you're seeing an example, and this was a very significant breakthrough, where you have superconducting through silicon vias that actually connect uh, these transmon uh, qubits. So this tells us that we have a path to create larger and larger and larger systems. In fact, we uh, reveal a roadmap for quantum computing last year that we updated this year as well. And I won't go into uh, a lot of detail, but suffice it to say, that this year we're going to deliver a system with 433 qubits. Next year we're going to break the 1,000 qubit barrier. And beyond that, we've demonstrated the path to create systems with over 4,000 and 5,000 qubits in the coming years. As well as a full software stack talking about you know, kernel algorithms and model developers so that we can raise the level of abstraction of this new form of computation. In fact, we have this vision, and I'll draw you a parallel that we've seen what CPU-centric supercomputers look like. We have seen over the last decade what AI-centric supercomputers look like, where GPUs you know, uh, play a major role in the ecosystem. And the next step is we're going to definitely see the emergence of quantum-centric supercomputers, where we're going to have the combination of CPUs, GPUs, and QPUs all working in concert. And this is illustrated by Quantum System 2 uh, that we've illustrated here, where we will build also quantum data centers that orchestrate and combine large numbers of quantum processors that are going to be connected to first order between machines first classically and over time through also intranet quantum links. And in the distant future, you will imagine also a quantum internet that will be able to connect using quantum information processing over large distances, different data centers. So the future now that you have a very brief overview of uh, quantum computing, is going to be this intersection, this combination of classical and quantum information. And this is where we have as a community a fantastic opportunity to bring the worlds and the communities of Ray and Qiskit together and explore their possibilities. And I just want to give you an example of how this may unfold, and there will be many examples that will be created. And in this case, I'm going to give the example of imagining that you are in a development team, uh, an R&D team, that is trying to create a better lithium chemistry technology for better batteries for electrification. And one of the tasks that you want to do is to explore different materials properties, and you're going to use simulation and computation as a means to accelerate the rate of development of the lithium chemistry technology. So that means in practice that one of the things you got to calculate is the ground state of the molecular Hamiltonian, of the energy system of this one. And without going into a lot of detail, just imagine it's going to involve four steps. You're going to have to define this molecular system, which is based on this lithium chemistry that you want to use for batteries. You have to define a variational form of this state, an initial state, and a solver. Those are the four steps that are going to be involved. And here, we're going to um, approach it, but we're going to use both Ray and Qiskit as the mechanism to perform this workflow, right, in this, in this example. So I'm going to show you through an animation what this program looks like of how we are, um, you know, embedding Qiskit uh, with Ray. So let, let's look at it for a minute on the different steps of what it's going to involve. So in this case, for this calculation, we have three computing environments. We have we're going to have the laptop of the user. We're going to have cloud classical resources that we're going to parallelize. And we're going to have a quantum data center. 
So here in the user machine that is in San Francisco, it's going to send the program to execute, and this is going to be uh, managed by Ray. So in this case, what we're going to parallelize and send is many Qiskit runtime solvers in parallel orchestrated by Ray, just like we would have machine learning you know, parallelization orchestrated by Ray. So in this case, what is going to run those solvers is uh, Qiskit runtime, which is going to execute the quantum calculations. So uh, Ray has sent many of these Qiskit runtimes. Now each Qiskit runtime goes and defines the primitive, the estimator, to calculate this, this ground state. And it starts the estimator session running on a quantum data center. It selects the right quantum resources to run it. And in this case, think about this as the equivalent of what CUDA would do in the GPU uh, world. And um, very often in this case, you have to iterate through this calculation. So in this case, uh, Qiskit runtime is going back and running the calculations a number of times. And then it's going to be streaming the results back to Ray. And in this case, then, the streaming of all these parallelized Qiskit runtimes that have been executed, Ray is aggregating them and then presenting back and delivering the, in this case, you see this energy curve as a function of in interatomic distance uh, of the atoms that you're calculating, which is the basis of the core property calculations that you use for your lithium chemistry in this case. So there is going to be this aspect of orchestration, parallelization, and scale out of classical resources, and orchestration and parallelization of quantum resources that Ray and Qiskit are going to be able to do together. The power, the benefit that we will get in doing that is that in this, the quantum computing continues to advance, we will get exponential speed ups on certain kind of problems that are incredibly important for business and, and society. So that is the potential that we have in front of you. The potential of you know, Ray and Qiskit, or put it in a different way, the orchestration of classical and quantum resources. And I think that that's the sort of call to action that I would like to bring forth, that the argument that the future of computing is a story of classical and quantum information working in concert. And I was so excited uh, when you know, Jan told me and invited me to come and, and give this keynote because it was the opportunity to take you know, the premier community that is looking at the parallelization and scale out of something as fundamental as cloud and AI, and now to combine it with the world of quantum. And I think we just have this potential to work together collaboratively as communities to really create what's next in computing. So thank you.